Okay. Um, probably saw Dr. Gunnett's bio online. He's a uh, professor emeritus at the University of Iowa and he specializes in space plasma physics and has been involved in like 30 different space, uh, um, space projects, um, particularly Voyager 1 and 2. Uh, he's actually one of the principal uh, investigators on that. And those little engines that could are still out there talking to us. And, um, but he was also involved in the Galileo mission, the Cassini mission, several others. Um, and uh, knew Dr. Van Allen personally. So he's going to discuss the developments that led to the Voyager mission, how we actually reached interstellar space. Hopefully he'll talk a little bit about how we knew we actually got there because there's no sign out there that says, you are now leaving the solar system. Thank you for visiting. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll talk a little bit about that. So I'm, you know, um, when I contacted JBL about a, a speaker on Voyager, first name that came out of Callie's mouth was uh, Dr. Gurnett. So I've been looking forward to hearing you talk. And if you'd please welcome Dr. Gurnett. Thank you. It's all yours. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. And congratulations to your organization for the 100th anniversary uh, that is very impressive. Uh, I should think you should have a talk, somebody talk, give you a talk of all the changes in astronomy in the last 100 years. <laughs> it's really quite staggering. And as uh, Gary said, I was essentially invited to talk about Voyager. Uh, however, I'm going to extend the discussion just a little bit. Uh, to discuss the circumstances under which the mission came into existence. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my involvement in Voyager, which has been almost, uh, almost from the very beginning. So it's been a really long mission. And so for the title of my talk, I said from the dawn of the space age, and you'll see what I mean by that in just a minute, to interstellar space. Now, I want to start the discussion about what, in my mind, is a famous year, 1957. Now, you can ask yourself what happened in 1957. Well, to me, it was a really important year. I graduated from high school. I didn't, had decided I wanted to go into electrical engineering, and I... Uh, arrived at the University of Iowa to study electrical engineering in late September of uh, 1957. So it's kind of a milestone in my life, if you want to put it that way. In 1957, on October 4th, just a few days after I arrived at the University, Sputnik 1 was launched. And I don't know how many of you remember that date, Judging from the faces I see, I should imagine there are some that do. You might put up your hands for the you see. And as you remember, and those that weren't born by then, I will tell you, uh, this had a tremendous impact on the United States because we were in the middle of the Cold War. And uh, we suddenly had a Russian object flying overhead. And it was clear that the uh, Soviet Union had surpassed the United States in uh, rocketry. And of course, the Germans had developed the, the V2 during the war, but our uh, knowledge and continuation of the rocket effort was rather meager. Now, uh, I'll give you a short history. Uh, there was a frantic, uh, a frantic effort to catch up with the Russians. That was what we call the beginning of the space race. And that culminated in a spacecraft called Explorer 1. And Explorer 1 was the first US spacecraft. It was launched on February 1st, 1958. And it was a uh, culmination of an effort by uh, at least three institutions. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, the Redstone Arsenal, which was headed by Werner von Braun of Apollo fame, and he had developed a intermediate range ballistic missile called Redstone. And 
uh, he was uh, campaigning to try to launch a spacecraft with Redstone, but Eisenhower would not let him launch it because we were in the middle of the Cold War and he was afraid of uh, offending the Russians. But he secretly, according to, the, you can read this in books about Von Braun, uh, he secretly developed and kept in the basement of a facility there, a redstone ro uh, rocket, which I show on the left over here, which had three stages. An upper stage here, which had a whole series of small, star, uh, small rockets. And then an even smaller stage up here at the top, which consisted of one solid propellant rocket. And that involved the payload uh, built by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And that payload had a Geiger tube uh, right here and some associated instruments that were being built by James Van Allen. And at the time I arrived at the university, I did not know James Van Allen, but he was working in the physics department, which was right across the street from the engineering building where I was studying, starting to study electrical engineering. And that spacecraft was launched successfully on February 1st, 1958. And here's an iconic picture that shows uh, Bill Pickering, William Pickering from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He was head of the JPL, we call it JPL then. Jim Van Allen in the center, who had uh, just come a few years earlier as the head of the physics department. He was interested in cosmic ray studies, especially he had done this, uh, developed a system called raccoons, which were carried up by balloons and had a small rocket and they could get to altitudes of like 100, 100 kilometers or 120 kilometers, something like that. And then Werner von Braun, who developed the, uh, uh, the, uh, explore, the uh, Redstone, well, it was called the Jupiter C with the upper stage. And uh, this picture was taken in the basement of uh, the National Academy of Science. It was taken in the early morning. It was a, it was a night launch. And uh, it was a great success in the sense that the US finally caught up months later, to some extent, with the Russians. But the Geiger tube on Explorer 1, which is, was designed to uh, study cosmic rays. Uh, Van Allen already knew from rocket, small rocket studies that there was a latitudinal gradient in the uh, cosmic ray intensity, and that was, called by the, that was caused by the dipole magnetic field of the Earth, which, which affects the trajectories of the cosmic rays that can get to the ground. And uh, uh, he made the first great discovery of the space age. The... Uh, Sputnik 1 just had a temperature sensor. It had no other instrumentation on it. But Van Allen discovered that sometimes the Geiger tube seemed to be broken, not working. But after some study of the data over a few weeks, they realized that it worked some of the time and then it, it would go into saturation. Uh, completely not counting. And that's because if you have high enough flux going through the Geiger tube, it goes into a continuous discharge and, and doesn't respond to individual particles. And uh, they concluded that there was a very intense radiation belt up there, which consists of charged particles that bounced back and forth, uh, being controlled by the magnetic field between two mirror points. And how those particles got there was a complete mystery. It was totally, totally unexpected. But the intensities were extremely high, actually dangerous to astronauts, even to today. The space station, for example, flies under the inner radiation belt here at low enough altitude that the uh, radiation intensity is uh, rather low. Now you can imagine that I, as a student, and by the way, during high school, I'd read several books about the possibility of uh, orbiting a spacecraft around the Earth, at least a theoretical possibility. And when Sputnik 1 was launched, they used to 
as some of you probably may remember those that were alive in those days, they would publish the time of the day that you could go out and see the spacecraft going over. Of course, it, it was only at certain times of the night because the spacecraft had to be illuminated by the sun. And I remember going out and watching Sputnik 1 go across the sky quite rapidly and was extremely impressed by this. In fact, I was so impressed that I walked across the street to the physics building and I went to Van Allen's office. And as I like to later say, uh, I wanted to ask him if he needed some help. Uh, in fact, I was referred to his secretary who I wrote down my qualifications. And actually I did have qualifications. Uh, I had spent most of my high school career uh, under the leadership of some people from Collins Radio, uh, developing uh, radio receivers and transmitters to control model airplanes. In fact, I was the US national champion in 1956. So I had quite a background in electronics and I wrote that down in a piece of paper and I told him I was an expert in radio, radio control communications. And he sent me a note and hired me. So at age 17, I started working for uh, James Van Allen. And uh, let me tell you, in those days, the University of Iowa was the center of space research. In fact, Van Allen with Explorer One, there were only two people working on the project. Uh, Van Allen, who developed the Geiger tube, and another electrical engineering student by the name of George Ludwig, who you may or may not have heard of. You can, you can look him up on the web. And he, like I was, he was a graduate student. I was an undergraduate, but uh, he was an engineering student. And all those early satellites we uh, launched uh, in very short order, Explorer 1, Explorer 2 failed, Explorer 3 uh, was a success, and then uh, Explorer uh, 7, 8, uh, all those were just uh, launched in a matter of a month. They all had analog uh, telemetry communication. That is, for example, if you wanted to measure voltage on a spacecraft, you, you had a, a voltage controlled oscillator, which had a switch that could switch to different sources and you would get a frequency that was proportional to the voltage. And that was sent to the spacecraft transmitter. And uh, if you listen to the signal coming back from Explorer 1, and I think you can find that on the web actually, it kind of went dee, 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 you know, shifting between different frequencies in order to transmit the, the voltage levels on the counters. Actually, the, it was kind of a bizarre, system. They had a binary counter, but they monitored the voltages on the stages in the counter via a VCO, voltage controlled oscillator. Uh, I was very interested in, in uh, what turned out to be called digital electronics. Of course, in those days, I was only familiar with tubes. So I quickly got uh, 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 knowledgeable about uh, transistors, which were just barely coming into existence. In fact, the word digital didn't even exist at that time. And there was another just recently hired young professor by the name of uh, Brian O'Brien that I started working for. And, and uh, Van Allen got a contract. He worked, he had worked in, during the war in, uh, with the Navy and he had lots of contracts in the uh, Office of Naval Research. And the Office of Naval Research funded Van Allen for a series of spacecrafts, which I show pictures of here. They were called the Iowa series of satellites. I call them the Iowa series. Actually, the, they were given by the Navy the name engine. Well, as I think you know from the Cleveland Indians, uh, anything to do with engine or Indians not very popular these days. So we're changing the name to the Iowa series of satellites. And I worked on all of, all of these uh, spacecraft as an electrical engineer, in particular on uh, engine, or I, I, I made a mistake already, on Iowa 1 over here, 
I designed a, a digital data system. Actually, I'd like to spend some time on, but I, I, I can't really take the time here to tell you how I did that. But, you know, it's basically we started out with count rates in a binary counter, and I simply found a way of shifting the contents of the binary counter out in sequence uh, to a modulator that modulated the transmitter and sent the data to the ground. We didn't have any computer on the ground to process the data. Uh, but nonetheless, it was easier to process even by hand than the analog data, which was extremely difficult. I, I could go into all those details. Uh, now, Engine 1 was a great success. Uh, I can remember to this day when we launched it out to uh, Cape Kennedy. And I, I might say I was an undergraduate. I think I was a sophomore at that point. But uh, my whole life revolved around uh, building space hardware with Van Allen. Uh, we built in with we built Iowa 2, uh, rocket failed it went in the Atlantic, and then by this time I was I was technically the project engineer in charge of the whole uh, project. Uh, that's not the scientific part. To Brian O'Brien and Van Allen are in charge of that, but I was in charge of the electronics, and then we went uh, and we built. Uh, the spacecraft uh, Iowa 3 here. And notice the time interval between building an entire spacecraft and this spacecraft have 13 instruments on board. Uh, let me remind you that Explorer 1 only had one, just one Geiger tube. Notice the time here is about a year. In fact, it was less than a year that we went from launching the, uh, fail, the rocket failure of uh, Iowa 2 to Iowa 3, so yeah, it was January 24th. So in less than a year, we built uh, this spacecraft over here. Now, uh, this spacecraft uh, changed my career, and I'm going to explain why. Uh, there was a guy came to uh, the University of Iowa by the name of Roger Gallet, and he gave a seminar about some curious space sounds things that we call plasma waves now. That is waves that propagate in the plasma. Uh, and uh, uh, he encouraged me to develop a receiver to detect these low, very low frequency radio waves. You may have, may have heard of some of them, for example, whistlers. Anybody heard of whistlers? I know I'm talking to astronomers here, this whole uh, discussion I'm going to have isn't going to be about plasma physics. I'll get to the Voyager in just a minute here. But I designed a receiver which amounted to essentially an audio amplifier that was hooked up to a loop, a loop antenna. And uh, I took it out to my father's farm. I had to take it away from the city because there was so much noise around the city due to 60 hertz power lines that we, you know, we couldn't really use it. There's too much noise. And I went out there for three nights. And finally, on the third night, I heard some whistlers. Whistlers are produced by lightning. I'll get into that in just a minute. So I went to Van Allen, and I told him I'd developed this receiver, and could I put it on the spacecraft? And he says, yes, go ahead and do it. <laughs> Nowadays, you can spend a year writing a proposal that has that many pages in it. And maybe two years later, you get an answer from NASA whether you, can, whether you get funded to fly for maybe a million dollars. Uh, well, Van Allen had $100,000 to build uh, uh, Iowa 3. That's, that's the amount of money we had involved. And this is a picture of me uh, sometime in December, I don't know, uh, December of 1961. We hadn't launched the spacecraft yet uh, with that spacecraft. Now I'm going to give you some kind of an idea of the kind of research I did back in that part of my career. Uh, as I told you, uh, whistlers are produced by lightning. And if you have a lightning stroke here on earth, it produces an electromagnetic wave. In fact, you can hear that in your car radio if there's a thunderstorm going on nearby. If you have your AM radio on, you can hear these kind of crashes on the radio. Uh, that's being produced by the lightning flash. And it emits frequencies from several hertz up to many megahertz. And if uh, you have a spacecraft flying overhead here in the ionosphere, now the ionosphere is a plasma, 
And it turns out that the higher frequencies travel faster than the lower frequencies. And when the lightning stroke occurs within a few microseconds, it emits a very broad range of frequencies, but the higher frequencies tra uh, travel faster and they get to the spacecraft or the ground. They had been heard on the ground also. Total, uh, hardly anybody knew anything about whistlers in those days. Uh, they would get to you first and the lower frequency would come later. So you'd hear this whistling tone that goes, I can't mimic that very well. Now I have here an actual recording from that pic of that same spacecraft I've just shown you. Uh, when we turned the transmitter on, we were flying over a thunderstorm. You could hear all kinds of uh, lightning strokes. Well, could you hear those okay? And do you understand the principle? Lightning stroke occurs, the wave goes up in the atmosphere, and we hear this whistling tone. Well, I eventually discovered uh, actually several new aspects of whistlers, and I wrote my PhD thesis on that on, on, on whistlers. Uh, we also detected uh, some other peculiar things, which are, have come to be known as dawn chorus. And these are this signal is not produced by lightning. Uh, in fact, we showed within just a matter of the first few months of uh, when the engine th the the spacecraft Iowa three was launched in orbit that these signals are produced by the outer radiation belt, the electrons, very intense electrons in the outer radiation belts, and it consists of rising tones. And I'll I'll play this for you. And there's a there's a moving cursor here. Uh oh. Uh, I got to click on it. I should have. I got to run my video. So uh, we showed that these signals are coming from the outer radiation belt. Something that I have to say, my advisor Jim Van El was very pleased to hear. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, we later, along with others, explain how this radio emission is produced. It turns out the, as the electrons spiral around the magnetic field, they emit an electromagnetic re, uh, radio wave, which is understandable. But part of that radio wave goes backwards, opposite the direction of propagation of the electrons, and organizes a phase of other electrons coming along the magnetic field and it gets these electrons organized in a group, which produce these whistling tones. Uh, so I'm, I, I later, I, I, I got to be quite well known in the field, actually as an undergraduate physics student, uh, doing this kind of research. And we ended up flying this, these instruments on many, many spacecraft. I, I think uh, 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 Gary, I said 30 some spacecraft that I flew instruments on. But and now let me tell you some more things about the early history in here, which leads up to, up to Voyager. About this same time, uh, it was also discovered that Jupiter is an intense radio emitter. Uh, and this discovery actually preceded, preceded the space age. Uh, there were uh, two guys, Burke and Franklin, using a ground radio receiver uh, uh, in, the, in the tens of megahertz region uh, back in the 1950s. They noticed very intense interference, they thought, and they didn't know where it was coming from, but they got lurking at the ephemeris of Jupiter as viewed from the ground, and they found, they discovered that this radio emission was occurring when Jupiter would come above the horizon. So they deduced that there was a very a rather intense radio signal produced uh, by charged particles moving in the magnetic field at Jupiter. That was the first evidence, or at least an interpretation, that suggests that Jupiter had an intense radiation belt. 
Then somewhat later, after Van Allen discovered the radiation belt at Earth, uh, Slonaker, using a higher frequency antenna, discovered what's now called decimetric radiation. That means 10 centimeter wavelengths. Uh, and he showed they're coming from Jupiter. And uh, initially, he didn't have very good angular resolution. But now that using the very VLA, the very large array, uh, you can make a, a picture of the decimetric radiation coming from Jupiter. And this picture was actually taken much more recently, although it's still, uh, let's see, that's 40 years ago, uh, made by Impke de Potter using the VLA. And this is actually uh, synchrotron radiation coming from very intense 100 MeV electrons in the magnetosphere of Jupiter. And so here's the, here's the radiation belt at Jupiter. And of course, some magnetic fields have been put on by a computer. I mean, you know, you knew this uh, position of the spacecraft. So these developments uh, led to a considerable interest in flying a spacecraft to Jupiter. And uh, in... Uh, 1969, the National Academy of Science Space Science uh, Report, uh, they made a proposal that we fly what was called the Grand Tour. And uh, there's some very, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the guy's name, but the Jet Propulsion Laboratory came up with the really brilliant idea that if you launch a spacecraft, at Earth in 1977, in between uh, uh, August, it had to be around August, September, 1977, on a trajectory to Jupiter. Uh, here we go to Jupiter. And if you target Jupiter at just the right uh, position, you can use the gravity of Jupiter to bend the trajectory and send the spacecraft onto Saturn. Not only that, you could use the so-called crack the whip effect to substantially increase the velocity of the spacecraft. You can almost double the velocity of the spacecraft by having Jupiter gravity essentially sling the spacecraft on to Saturn. And that you could do that again at Saturn and get to Uranus and get to Neptune. Now this, because these planets go around the sun, of course, at different rates, uh, Earth, of course, going around every year, and Jupiter is 12 years, and uh, I think Saturn's around 30 years. It's pretty obvious that this lineup of the outer planets is a very rare circumstance. In fact, it's once every 79 years that you get the four outer planets, the big, these big gas planets lined up in the proper way that with a single spacecraft, you can go by all four spacecraft. So this was recognized and, and uh, written up in this National Academy of Science report, and it was proposed as a mission. Uh, I might point out here that the gravity assist cuts the flight time to Neptune down from 30 years using our best rocket to 12 years. And you could get to Neptune. Uh, it actually, it turned out we got to Neptune in uh, November of 1989, not quite like shown on this trajectory. So this mission was proposed and uh, it was proposed to Congress. And in Congress's grand wisdom about funding, it was declared too expensive and it was rejected. Well, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory who was involved in uh, developing the spacecraft to carry out this mission, uh, renamed the mission the Mariner Jupiter Saturn mission, proposing it just goes to Jupiter and Saturn. And they lowered the price, and Congress uh, funded the project. And so it was originally called Mariner Jupiter Saturn, and only later was the name uh, changed to Voyager. So let me talk now a bit about the spacecraft. Uh, here is a spacecraft that was developed at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It was con constructed all at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And uh, it consisted of a 
what we call a high gain antenna, which of course had to be pointed back at Earth in order to transmit the radio signal back to the Earth. And just to get the size scale, that's about 12 feet across here. Uh, weighed 100, uh, about 1,800 pounds. Uh, and that's the empty weight, I believe, if I remember right, without propellant. Uh, since we got so far from the sun, you really can't very well use solar array for power because the sun intensity from the sun gets so weak. So we used a plutonium power supply, plutonium 238, and that consists of these three elements uh, right here. And I could talk more about the problems of getting approval. It took presidential approval uh, to launch the spacecraft because the radiation concerned about you know a nuclear power supply on the spacecraft. It's not a reactor. It was actually a radioactive heater that maintained the temperature gradient across the thermocouple. And initially it put out 470 watts and it's now down to about 240. I'll talk more about that later. Now we had uh, for transmitter, we had actually two transmitters, a transmitter, a traveling wave tube and a backup. And it emitted all 22 watts. So the power doesn't even come close to a 100 watt light bulb. It isn't even close to a 50 watt light bulb. And uh, we have two transmit bandwidths, X band and S band, which I forget exactly, but they're up in the microwave region. And this was the first spacecraft, despite the fact by this time I had lots of experience flying on uh, NASA spacecraft, originally ONR, but then NASA. It had a, but it was the first spacecraft that had a computer that, that I had to deal with building our instruments. And this computer had 186 kilobytes of memory. And that, of course, you probably recognize that even with a simple uh, uh, flash drive now has more, far more memory than that. So it's just, just had a tiny memory. Uh, we had to really go to great lengths to, to program the computer because it, it used, uh, uh, let's see, I forget the language, but a very simple language. Uh, from Jupiter with the high gain antenna, we could get back 115 kilobits per second. Uh, there were 10 instruments. I can go through the list, but I won't now. Uh, four of them, which are now operating. And uh, uh, we proposed and eventually had success in getting an instrument flown on uh, Iowa. That at the top, you may not be able to read it. I can't see it. It's the Iowa, uh, the Iowa radio and plasma wave instrument. And we used uh, two long antennas here, 10, 10 meter antennas, which are extendable. They were actually tank antenna during World War II. That's where the design came from. And they came out of an extension mechanism here that had a flat piece of beryllium copper that kind of rolled it up into a tube and allowed us to make uh, very long antennas. Now, this uh, instrument was actually patterned after Iowa 3, the instrument I played just a while ago with Twistlers. Uh, that is, it was designed to transmit back the exact signals we could pick up on the antenna. Now, to get the signals back to the ground, I actually uh, wanted them to give me a wire to the transmitter so I could put our audio output directly on the transmitter, but they wouldn't do that. So I came up with a system where we uh, converted the signal to digital in exactly the same format as the digital data from the camera. And uh, I convinced them to fly it, fly that system with a switch that switched between our instrument and the camera. So uh, we were able to transmit back uh, 128,000 bit per second samples of the sounds on our antenna uh, that could be detected by our antenna to, to the ground. And uh, we, we could do that by, by sending the signals to the onboard spacecraft uh, uh, tape recorder, which by the way, is still working. It launched in 1977 and uh, on both spacecraft, the tape recorder is just a simple uh, tape recorder and it's still, uh, still operating. Uh, now, of course, uh, 
Voyager made the first flybys of the giant outer planets and gave the first close-up pictures of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And not only the picture, but we also detected, for example, when we flew by Jupiter, we detected whistlers, and that showed that Jupiter had lightning. So I was the first person to uh, discover a lightning on a planet other than Earth, and we did that by detecting the radio signals from lightning. Uh, we also detected uh, lightning at Saturn and with other instruments like on Cassini and Galileo, which Gary, I think, mentioned earlier. We also confirmed the existence of lightning on Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. In fact, with the Cassini space grade, we had a kind of routine monitor of the weather on Saturn by monitoring the occurrence of uh, lightning. Uh, now, after flying by Neptune, of course, the trajectory, the spacecraft due to the gravity assist was now on an escape trajectory from the sun. And this uh, shows the trajectory. This plot over here shows a view looking down on the uh, ecliptic plane from, from the north of uh, the ecliptic plane and it shows the trajectory of the two spacecraft, this being, this being Voyager 1 and this being Voyager 2. And this shows the trajectory viewed edge on looking at the uh, ecliptic plane. And uh, I need to tell you a little bit more about this because when we got to Saturn, a decision was made to go to the big moon Titan. And once you make that decision, we couldn't go on to Uranus and Neptune. And uh, because of that, to get to Titan uh, using the gravity of Saturn, the trajectory was deviated to a sharp angle upward out of the ecliptic plane. And that's, that's why the spacecraft is moving up out of this ecliptic plane. And we're up here well, in 2000, uh, 2021, we're out right as of today, we're at 154.1 AU for Voyager 1. And for Voyager 2, we're at 128.2 AU. Now at this great distance for Voyager 1, it takes 18 hours uh, for the radio signal to get back to Earth, uh, which is a very impressive day. We're, we're, we're getting close to being a, a light day uh, from Earth. Of course, that's supposed to impress astronomers, but I'm not sure I'm effective at impressing all of you, since you like to think in terms of light years. But we're nowhere, we're nowhere close to a light year, but we are approaching a light day. Uh, now, uh, let me uh, talk a bit about, I, I forgot to say here, we renamed the, the spacecraft to Voyager Interstellar Mission. Now, why did we call it the, the interstellar mission? Uh, well, the reason is, uh, let me go back. I have to tell you a bit about the solar wind, which you probably may know about. If you take a, uh, a, a picture uh, of the sun with the sun blanked out here, like is done by the Sol uh, SOHO spacecraft, uh, you can see these things that look like magnetic field lines, and they really, they really are indicative of magnetic field lines. And you get the strong impression that there's a plasma flowing outward from the sun. And that plasma is called the solar wind. It was really first guessed that there was such a wind even back as far as the late 1930s because of the tail of comets, which were often seen to be moving at a great velocity away from a comet. So, uh, and that was later confirmed by direct uh, spacecraft observations in the 1960s, that there is indeed a wind blowing continuously out from the sun at a very high velocity, a velocity of uh, about a million miles per hour. Uh, at that speed, it takes about, about two days for plasma to go from the sun. Incidentally, all this gas out here, most of this gas is a plasma because of the very high temperature. Uh, the sun, had the temperature in the corona is like, is like uh, 10, 10, it can be a million degrees. It's very, 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 very hot. 
so uh, even before the beginning of the space age, we had a, a kind of an impression that there would be a wind blowing out from the sun. And that was later theoretically explained by Gene Parker of uh, fame from the University of Chicago. There is a spacecraft now going to, uh, to, uh, around the sun called the Parker Solar Pro, which you may be following the latest on that. And uh, of course, as most sci as scientists are, uh, people ask the question, well, where does the solar wind end? You know, if it's, if it's flowing out outward from the sun here, radially outward in all directions from the sun. By the way, you can, you can confidently predict the density in the solar wind of the plasma has to vary as one over R squared, because as the plasma expands into a bigger, bigger volume, as it moves out from the sun, the density simply has to go down. And so the concept was developed that there's a, a gas between the stars which we call the interstellar medium. And that as the solar wind expands, eventually the ram pressure of the solar wind, you know, the ram pressure is what you feel when you put your hand outside the window of a car. Well, there's a solar wind ram pressure there, uh, which is MV squared. Uh, when that pressure equals the interstellar gas pressure, the solar wind be, would be stopped. Now, there was at one time a great controversy that, well, could there be a boundary there? In fact, the boundary, if it existed, was called the heliopause, the boundary between the gas coming out from the sun and the interstellar medium. But some people thought that the solar wind would just get gradually eroded away. And uh, so there wouldn't be any such boundary. But I would say that modern plasma physics uh, really shows that plasmas tend to act like a uh, field, like a medium with the magnetic field frozen in it. So the strong opinion was developed that there would be such a boundary out here and that we called the boundary the heliopause. Uh, we didn't know how far the heliopause was from the sun because we had no idea of the density of the interstellar medium. These are some modern numbers, but really back in the 50s and 60s, we had essentially no idea of the gas pressure on the interstellar medium. Now, one has to, in considering the shape of this boundary, this heliopause, one has to also consider the fact that the sun is moving with respect to the interstellar plasma. We know, for example, that the sun is moving with respect to the interstellar, uh, the nearby stars. And in fact, we know directly that it's moving relative to the interstellar medium because we can detect neutral gas, which is not affected since it's not ionized. It can go all the way into the earth and be directly detected. So curiously enough, we know that the direction of the interstellar medium flow is about 23 kilometers per second, and it's coming from, well, the direction I show over here, which is, which is known in the, uh, uh, in the ecliptic coordinate system quite well these days. Now, uh, as the uh, solar wind expands out from the sun, because it is moving at such a high velocity, supersonic, greater than the speed of sound, in order for the gas to be de deviated, the plasma to be deviated around the heliopause, it has to under undergo a shock transition. Now, that was a theoretical prediction, which turned out, of course, to be true. And we call that the termination shock. So th this is a theoretical concept that was developed way back in the late uh, 50s, early 60s. And uh, I, I, I can confirm from Voyager that we did in fact see a shockwave, although I'm not going to talk much about that. Uh, now, uh, let me talk about another thing here uh, that has to do with Voyager, and that is the cosmic ray gradient. Uh, you may have heard of the cosmic ray gradient. Uh, it, uh, the concept comes from the fact that the solar wind has embedded in it a magnetic field. Uh, 
it's called it comes from a theorem called the frozen field theorem you can you can go get my book on the introductory plasma physics from cambridge university press and read about that and it turns out that the solar wind out here is actually quite turbulent the magnetic field is very turbulent and Cosmic rays, which come from great distances in outer space, in fact, it's even still controversial how they are produced. Uh, as the cosmic rays uh, approach the solar system from the outside, and of course, you know, if you set a Geiger tube on a table, it'll sit there and count detecting cosmic rays. Those cosmic rays are deflected in kind of a random way. They're bounced backward, outward from the sun due to the interaction with the interstellar turbulence. And this, uh, this has a very direct observable effect on the cosmic ray intensity. In particular, the cosmic ray intensity, uh, just if you count it here with a Geiger tube you know, in your lab, the cosmic ray intensity undergoes an 11 year cycle, the so-called 11 year solar cycle. It, it reaches a maximum intensity, and it turns out it reaches a maximum uh, when there's a minimum number of solar spots, sunspots. And when the sunspot number is a maximum, it reaches the lowest intensity. And the reason for that is when there's a large number of sunspots present on the sun, that increases the amount of turbulence by a mechanism I could go into if you want to discuss it. Uh, it increases the magnetic turbulence in the solar wind and thereby uh, keeps cosmic rays from getting into the inner part of the solar system. So that's how we know there even knew very, even in the 30s, uh, that there was a uh, probably a cosmic ray gradient out here. But of course, since we had no spacecraft out here back in the 50s, it wasn't directly measurable. It was a theoretical concept. Now, uh, of course, uh, the question that we had was, well, how far is it to the heliopause? And one way that was proposed to measure the distance to the heliopause is as you have a spacecraft moving outward from the sun, as for example, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are doing, and we had some other spacecraft also called Pioneer 10 and 11 doing the same thing. If you could measure the gradient in the cosmic ray intensity versus radial distance from the sun, you could imagine taking this gradient and extrapolating it out to a, a straight line until you get to the interstellar, interstellar cosmic ray intensity, and that would give you the, the distance to the heliopause. Of course, a tremendous flaw in that reasoning is we didn't know the, the interstellar cosmic ray intensity. Worse than that, the 11 year solar cycle messes up your measurement of the cosmic ray intensity. So here you are, you're on a spacecraft going out from the sun and you might think in a direct way, if everything stayed constant, you could measure that gradient, but the trouble is the sunspot number is changing during the solar cycle. So that messes that all up. So there was a tremendous controversy or uh, discussion, I will say, starting in the fifties of the distance uh, to the heliopause. And I, uh, with some humor, I might tell you, I made up uh, a few years ago, a list of all the published, uh, published papers on the distance to the heliopause. How far out was the heliopause? Well, uh, Meyer, uh, which I knew, I was at the Max Planck Institute at one point and he was there. Uh, he guessed it was maybe 5 AU, and I'll have to say guess was probably the best word to describe it. Well, 5 AU, is, that's, that's Jupiter. And I'll tell you, we went by Jupiter with Voyager 1 and 2, and we didn't detect the heliopause. Uh, Davis, who originally came up with the concept of the, of the heliopause, he, he also made a guess of 5 to 30. Really, uh, none of these people had any. Actually, I, I like to describe it as Imagine you're, a fog, you're in a fog bank and you're trying to estimate where the edge of the fog bank is. <laughs> That's what you're dealing with when you're dealing with cosmic rays out there. 
you just have no way of actually accurately guessing the distance of the cosmic rays. And various people over the years came up with distance to the uh, cosmic rays, including Van Allen and Randall, and they used the cosmic gray gradient to guess that it was 190 AU. Now, you might notice my name down here at the bottom, 1993, Gurnett et al. I published a paper in 1993, and I estimated the distance as being 116 to 177 astronomical units. Uh, at that time, Voyager was at about, Voyager 1, which is the farthest out, was at about 50 AU, or maybe it was Pioneer 10. I can't remember. I'll show you in just a minute. This was not received very well. Let me tell you, because with Voyager 1 being at 50 AU, that could mean we had another 60 AU to go. And with Voyager 1, we're only moving out about 3, 3 AU per year. So it was clear it would take more than 20 years to get to the helium, maybe even 30. And uh, also, although my prediction was uh, uh, meant with uh, respect at scientific meetings, I would have to say, uh, I think nobody believed it, or very few people believed it. Now, so let me tell you what the basis of that prediction was. Uh, it was actually based on a very, very sound pr principle, which I will explain and is slightly complicated, but not too complicated. Uh, in uh, 1982, after we, after we passed the orbit of Saturn, we detected a radio emission event in the frequency range, well, from about two to three kilohertz. That's, that's a really low frequency for a radio emission, right? Two to three kilohertz. Not a plasma wave, it was actually a radio wave. And uh, uh, you can see it remained intense for about a year. And I'm going to play this for you because I generated this picture. See, it's a spectrum frequency here versus year. And that's a total of, let's see, 14 years going across here. So I'll bet you don't hear very many people that, that show you spectrograms that last 14 years. So I'm going to play this and you'll hear it. So here we come. I hope you can hear it. First event lasted possibly as much as three years. And then we didn't hear anything at all comparable to that. We had no idea where this was coming from. I thought it might be another planet, maybe Jupiter. We couldn't be even sure of that. Notice there's some other very weakness here. Sorry, I'm talking. Then there was a really big event in 1992. And that event lasted a long time, especially at low frequency, 1995. Notice that the first event here, uh, Voyager 1 was, on, this was Voyager 1 that I'm showing here, was only about 18 AU out, uh, wasn't very far. But by the time we got to the very intense 1992 event, we were Voyager 1 was out at 50 AU. Uh, seemingly a long ways out, but still nothing like my number of 116 AU. Now, uh, we didn't know where this radio emission was coming from. In fact, I'll have to admit at the time, I thought this might be an astrophysical source. I had, I had dreams of a Nobel Prize some kind of exotic astrophysical object that was emitting in the two to three kilohertz range. But it turns out that even these intensities were too high for any conceivable astro uh, astrophysical object. They were even too high for any known planetary object because it would take almost all the energy of the solar wind interacting with the planet to, uh, to uh, produce this kind of a radio emission. But I did make an interesting discovery, which I will show you next. Uh, here's the intense 1992 radio emission event. And I looked at the cosmic ray data and I discovered that 400 days later, over a year, a year and uh, you know how many days, uh, a year and about 30 days earlier, there was a very intense decrease in the cosmic ray intensity at a neutron monitor on the Earth called the at Climax that 
It was a neutron monitor, actually. Uh, and uh, had a very big decrease. Even better than that, I looked back at the 1983 event and I found there was another one of these sharp decreases, also 400 days earlier. Well, two events doesn't make a proof, but uh, it certainly indicated there was a strong event between these cosmic ray decreases and the occurrence of these intense radio emissions. Now, these the, the cosmic ray decreases uh, they're called Forbush decreasers. And uh, that, that's named after Scott Forbush, who in 1937 first reported these things. And the explanation that uh, came to be, and these, by the way, in the entire history of cosmic ray recordings at Earth, these are the two most intense cosmic ray decreases ever observed this one being 21% and this being 30%. And these are the two most intense two to three kilohertz radio emission events that were ever observed by Voyager so far. Uh, now, let me explain what Forbush decreases are. The idea behind the Forbush decrease is at the sun, you have a series of solar flares, or as they are called, these days, coronal mass ejections, essentially explosions on the sun. And here's a picture of one of them. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure I remember what wavelength this is in, but you, but you can see these at the sun. When there's a flare occurs at the sun or a solar mass ejection, you can see this plasma being ejected out from the sun at a very high velocity, uh, about a million miles per hour. And just to give you an impression, it takes, it takes about two days for that to get out to the Earth. And that's the reason you see uh, Aurora suddenly brighten up at Earth when that uh, arrives at the sun, that the blast of plasma comes out through the sun. Well, sometimes there's a whole series for an entire solar radi uh, rotation of such coronal mass ejections. And uh, the theory from a cartoon point of view is that these mass ejections form into a global shock wave, uh, pictured here in a cartoon sense as a sphere propagating out from the sun. And that, there's a lot of turbulence behind that shock. And that turbulence reflects cosmic rays, especially the turbulence in the magnetic field. And so th that reflects cosmic rays and sharp, causes a sharp decrease in the cosmic ray intensity, which is called a Forbush decrease. Now, the fact that I related the radio emission intensity to a, uh, a Forbush decrease, that told me that these radio emission intensities were associated with a great blast wave, a shock wave coming out from the sun from a period of solar, uh, solar events. And I invented the so-called heliopause shock interaction hypothesis. And here is the basic idea. Uh, this shows the actually geometric circumstance in 1992. We had uh, Voyager 1 about here, uh, Voyager 2 here, Pioneer 10 here, Pioneer 11 over here. So we had at least four monitors out there so we could detect shock waves. Not only that, at the Earth, which is way in here someplace, I didn't show it, uh, we also have the neutron monitors on the ground. And uh, it turns out we detected this shock wave that originated from a series of solar events in 1991. Uh, actually, uh, uh, May, uh, in uh, uh, June, May, June, 1991. And they created, they merged into a huge, global disturbance propagating out from the sun, which is shown here. And I advanced the hypothesis that when that shock wave got to the heliopause out here, it produced a radio emission. That's what I mean by the interaction hypothesis, uh, that the shock wave when it interacted with the heliopause produces this intense radio emission, which we detected. Now you might wonder, well, that's kind of a crazy idea. 
uh, how would I, why would I think that a shock wave interacting with the, uh, with the heliopause would produce a radio emission? Uh, well, it turns out there's some very good reasons for that. Because solar radio bursts, uh, we know a lot from how radio emissions are produced. And one of the mechanisms is the shock wave, uh, when it interacts with a gradient of plasma, generates electron plasma oscillations. Now, this is not a plasma physics course, but let me tell you that the electrons in a plasma can oscillate. If you, if you displace them from their normal condition, there's a restoring force and they'll sit there and oscillate back and forth. And we call that electron plasma oscillation. They're discussed in the very second chapter of my book. They are excited, we believe, we have good reasons for this by an electro electron beam coming out upstream of the shock that excites the plasma oscillations. And those plasma oscillations produce radio emission. So I propose that the shock wave propagating out from the sun and the oscillation frequency here has to go down as one over R. That's because the frequency was dependent on the density and the density goes as one over R squared so the plasma frequency goes as one over R. That means it's a straight line on a log log plot like this. Very simple theory in some respects. And uh, uh, now we didn't know what the density in the solar wind was at all, really at all. But we guess there are some intelligent guesses from ultraviolet measurements of the density in the nearby interstellar medium that the density might be on the order of a, uh, ten, uh, 10 to the minus one per cubic centimeter. Uh, that's 10 to the fifth electrons per cubic meter. And uh, from the formula for the plasma frequency, that turns out to be just right about three kilohertz. So I propose this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, shock wave interaction mechanism at the heliopause. Now, uh, so, uh, we had then a way of getting the distance to the heliopause from a fundamental principle. All I had to do was know the speed of the shock, how fast the shock's moving out from the sun and 400 days. And from the very old, almost high school principle of distance equal velocity times time, I could get the distance to the, I could get to the distance to the heliopause. So what is the, speed of the shock wave. Well, uh, we uh, this is a time down here, shows time in years. And this is, uh, this is the cosmic ray intensity at the Earth. And here's the former decrease at Earth, which was in May, June of uh, 19, let's see, 1991. Now, uh, we had four spacecraft that could detect the shock. And they were Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2. Now, Pioneer 10 did not actually have the proper instrumentation to detect a shock, but it did detect a forward decrease right here. You can see the cosmic ray intensity went down. Now, at Voyager 1, uh, no, this is Pioneer 11, we actually detected the shock with the magnetometer, and there was a very sharp forward decrease. Voyager 1, there's a shock was detected again by the magnetometer, sharp forward decrease. And uh, at Voyager 2, we can also detect a shock both from the plasma instrument and from the uh, magnetometer. So having seen the shock go by all these spacecraft, you can then make an estimate of the speed of the shock. And we got a number about six to 800 kilometers per second. Now, let me tell you that this business of measuring uh, sh shock velocities for a global shock is not all that simple because these these are all lined up in a line, the spacecraft that is, you know, it'd be straightforward. You could uh, get the velocity, but you had to model somehow. And we had to guess it was kind of a spherical shock. And we got a number of about six to 800 kilometers per second. So using this uh, revered uh, principle of distance equal velocity times time, I went about setting the, computing the distance to the heliopause. And I'll have to tell you, I was first very depressed because when I took eight, 800 kilometers per second times 400 days working out the right units, I got 200 AU. 
And that was a long ways. In fact, that was farther than Voyager could ever receive until we ran out of power. Uh, so I did a little modeling and you have to recognize here's the sun and here's the termination shock where the solar wind velocity goes subsonic. And then here's the heliopause. And we were estimating the velocity in here of six to 800 kilometers per second. But when the shock wave gets out to the termination shock, it would almost certainly slow down because the speed of the solar wind had to decrease out there. You know, it went through a shock, went from supersonic to subsonic, uh, has to go to a sort of, sort of speed. We also didn't know precisely the ratio of the distance from the termination shock to the heliopause. But for some computer models, we could develop these ratios. And we had to even model this. And so pretty much the distance from the heliopause was velocity times time with just a correction factor here, which wasn't too much. It was uh, a little less than one, but it wasn't too big a jump. And we published this. And we got a distance of 116 AU. I should have put the units on there. I forgot that. That's at 600 kilometers per second. At the higher velocity, 800 kilometers, we get 177. So I present this at scientific meetings. And as I said, uh, people were uh, uh, cordial, but I don't think anybody believed it. And uh, I kept for years, actually for nearly 10 years, I would come to a scientific meeting and I would report based on our radio results that I thought the shock wave was good, the heliopause was going to be out at 116 AU. Well, we finally did go through the termination shock, and I think that was at 94, and I didn't show that data here. But the real proof of the pudding was uh, because of my theory about plasma oscillation and how radio emissions are produced. If we finally detected the plasma oscillations, and I could do that with our, my instrument, then that would show we were in, in the interstellar medium. And finally, uh, we did detect the plasma oscillations, and there were some changes in the cosmic ray intensity on August 25th of 2012. And shortly after that, we detected plasma oscillations right here. And that proved, in fact, you can read across here and you can get the density and that was 0.06 electrons per cubic centimeter, somewhat shy of the number some of the UV people were predicting. But now I can play this and you can hear it because of our very high rate sampling, we can actually hear this oscillation detected by our electric antenna. So I'll play this and you can listen for it. This one will be the strongest and most easily, but this is the first one we actually detected. So here we go. Now these are all caused by shock waves. So these are dependent on shock in here. Now in this case, this we believe is actually the density jump in the, due to the shock wave. And this is, we believe, radio emission coming out ahead of the shock, just like we predicted. And these are plasma oscillations here. And uh, there was, uh, I will have to tell you, uh, a lot of people, even then, didn't believe this. In fact, uh, Ed Stone, who is a project scientist, it still is a project science, always has been on Voyager since the launch. Uh, he had a inquisition over the telephone of all the Voyager uh, PIs, including me, and I call it a Roman inquisition. I don't consider myself Galileo, but I had to defend all this. In fact, we had three such events, uh, that is, uh, myself defending the interpretation of these as plasma oscillations and that we knew what we we're talking about. And I'm a plasma physicist. I actually have a background in cosmic rays with Van Allen, but fundamentally I'm a plasma physicist and plasma oscillations are a, an aspect 
of plasma physics. You can read about it in almost any plasma, plasma book you pick up. And I had a great deal of credibility on the interpretation that we were in fact in interstellar space and that this event was a density of 0.1 per cubic centimeter. And after a year of, uh, shall I call, inquisition, and I published this in Science, which of course was reviewed by my scientific colleagues, and it was accepted and published in Science in a, in a paper in uh, 1990. Let's see, what, what year was it? 2013, you can look this up if you like. And uh, that convinced NASA that Voyager had in fact reached interstellar space. Uh, the reason they were so sensitive about this is they didn't want to go out and say Voyager finally got to interstellar space, which they regarded as, as kind of a, one of the mission objectives. Uh, they didn't want to make any mistakes. But I convinced our scientific colleagues that we were right. And I believe my entire story that I published in 19, way back in 19, 20, 20 years earlier, for 20 years, I advertised this theory as being correct. And it's now been vindicated. And it says the first human made object of engineering in the interstellar space of astronomy magazine, breathtaking first NASA's Voyager exit the solar system. And to go boldly, you probably heard that before, uh, New York Daily Moves. And here's an even more one, like circumnavigating the globe for the first time or having a footprint on the moon for the first time. That was in the BBC News. Now, uh, Gary, I could stop the uh, uh, presentation at this point, if you like. I have a couple more slides I'd like to show. Uh, I don't know how I haven't been keeping track of my watch, how I'm doing on time. Uh, I could give some more details on Voyager, and I'll do as you like here. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to guess that there's a bunch of questions out here. <laughs> well, they may, I may be able to answer those with the next couple slides if you give me a chance. Sure, let's go ahead and do that. Let me go through these quite quickly. Uh, because of our plasma oscillation and our ability to measure the density, we're the only instrument to, to measure the in situ density out in interstellar space. And this is a plot of the number density versus radial distance in AU. And these are our measurements out here from our instrument. Now, there were other instruments on the spacecraft that could measure the density also. And they are shown over here. But none of those can measure the density out here, it turns out. And in, and here's the heliopause. And you can see there's a jump of almost a factor of 50, 20 to 50 at the heliopause. And that was part of our prediction because the, the solar plasma is so hot, it's 100,000 to a million degrees. And the interstellar plasma is relatively cool, only 10,000 degrees. In order to have a temperature balance across the heliopause, you have to have abrupt increase in the density. This seems counterintuitive, possibly, that if you go into interstellar space, the density has to go up. But that was, in fact, part of our prediction. I will also show you from the cosmic ray instrument the galactic cosmic ray intensity, which is, was of considerable interest. And uh, here's the cosmic ray intensity from uh, this is actually Ed Stone's instrument. And uh, this is as a function of time and year, but here is radial distance for Voyager 1. And by the way, here you can see the solar cycle effect. That's the thing that screws up the uh, cosmic ray gradient. And finally, we get out to this beyond the termination shock. That's, there's a very turbulent region out here that we call the heliosheath, and that's where the cosmic rays were being mostly impeded from getting into the interstellar medium. And here's the interstellar intensity out here. And by the way, I don't have his latest data here, but it's been essentially constant since then. But what I want to point out here is the cosmic ray intensity out, out in, in interstellar space is almost a factor of five. But well, it can be about a factor of five of what you actually get at Earth. So the, the heliosphere, 
the magnetic fields in the heliosphere are actually shielding us by a factor of five from the cosmic ray flux that we would get out in interstellar space. Now, I have one more slide. I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, technical question. I, this might be some of the questions your people might answer. Uh, radio communication problems. Well, we're getting so far from the Earth uh, that in order to be able to get our data off the tape recorder, we have to have an array of the largest antenna they have at a deep space network, which is a 70 meter, that's 210 foot diameter antenna, plus three 34 meter antennas. These have to be arrayed together to decode the signal. Uh, our power supply has been uh, slowly decaying. It has a half, uh, half life 87 years, and its output is decreasing about four watts per year. And it was predicted that in 19, uh, 2021, that's this year, there would have to be enough power to operate all the instruments. And we've had to start turning some of the heaters off. In fact, uh, we're now at about 100, well, almost 146 AU. And by about 19, uh, 2030, we'll not have enough power to operate the spacecraft. So that's uh, that's the end of my, sorry, I used a little more time, but uh, this covered some questions and I thought, you know, you might be interested. I'll take I'll take questions now, if that's okay, Gary, if you have enough time. That absolutely works for us. Thank you so much. Uh, this was uh, exactly what I was looking for as far as, how did you really figure that out? And uh, that's, you know, I'm really, really impressed. Um, how did I figure? Is, how, how stressful were you when they shut down the uh, deep space network there for, did you ever think that we may not be able to get uh, recontact with it? Well, uh, actually, I'll have to tell you that the telemetry signal to noise ratio is an easily computed effect. Uh, you, of course, have to have the high gain antenna. By the way, there's thrusters on board that keep the high gain antenna point back from the Earth. But uh, this, this is a well calculated thing. And the only way we could communicate farther out would be to build more antennas. In fact, they just added another antenna at a deep space network. So uh, that's, uh, that's a straightforward telemetry calculation. Now, I might tell you when the spacecraft was designed back in 1970s, I, I actually looked that up in our proposal. We did propose to make measurements in interstellar space. But actually, we were just hoping we would get the spacecraft to operate to Saturn. <laughs> so you might say we were counting on some luck. But uh, the facts are uh, the spacecraft is in a very benign environment out there. The temperature is almost completely constant. That is, as long as we have the, re the heaters, which rely on their energy, energy from the radioactive solar supply. And that, that's one of the most damaging thing for electronics is to have the temperature be cycled. So I guess I would say I, I had a pretty good hope, that, and so did many others, that, that we would uh, still be able to get into interstellar space. But nobody, I think, guessed it would be this far out. Uh, in fact, like I said, there were a lot of people didn't want to believe our results when we, we predicted it would be at least 20 years till we got there. In fact, there was intense financial pressure to turn Voyager off and things like that back in the, back in the late 80s. I've got kind of a long answer. Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, and... Um... I guess I was going to say you're you're uh, in year forty of a ten year mission, right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we have we've stretched the ten. Well, our mission was well as originally funded by Congress. It was Mariner, uh, uh, Jupiter, Saturn. Which uh, let's see, it took us about a year and a half uh, to get to Jupiter. Another couple three years. That was about uh, let's see. Uh, uh, I, I can't remember. I think that took us about eight years to get Saturn. I can't do the mathematics here quickly in my head. But of course, once we got to Saturn, uh, Uranus and Neptune were still in the same place. 
So we renamed it the mission. We renamed it the Voyager Uranus Neptune mission. Of course, we added money because it would take money to operate the spacecraft and do all the planning for taking pictures and so forth. And then we, uh, when we got to Neptune, we renamed it the Interstellar Mission, and we made a case to try to get to interstellar space. And we have, we've reached interstellar space. And not only that, we're finding interstellar space is actually quite interesting. Uh, I, I didn't go into that, but I'm writing, I've written three papers already this year as an emeritus professor, by the way, published in Astrophysical Journal on some of the interesting things that are happening in interstellar space. So it makes some of us pretty excited, actually. Excellent. Well, I'll turn the meeting over to, to Len here. I'm going to open it up for questions. OK. OK, well, first of all, thank you so much. What a, a what astronomy lesson, what a history lesson. Uh, uh, anyway, thank you so much. Any, uh, we, we got a minute or two or three for questions. Anybody else have any question at this point? Sure, I, I might apologize. This was not exactly an astronomy lecture. I'm a plasma physicist, but I'm also kind of an astronomer. I've taught astronomy, I don't know, maybe four or five times to 300 students. So I, uh, by the way, I never took a course in astronomy either. Uh, everything I learned came from Voyager, sort of, by, by sort of being there. I'll be quiet <laughs> if there are more questions. Any any other questions at this time? Uh, I don't. I don't. I'm not sure how to tell if anyone's got a question. I don't well, see. I'll, any I'll, I'll venture a question. Uh, what are we going to do in the future? Well, there's a group of us are planning a further interstellar mission that's even better than Voyager, and we're in the process of trying to sell this to NASA and then to Congress. And the idea is to get to 1,000 AU in 50 years. Uh, I'll just have to tell you that. And uh, hmm. of course, I don't know if I have a good chance of uh, getting an instrument on that mission, but I would certainly like to. OK, um, I will toss out. I forgot to put this reminder earlier, March 3rd is our 100th anniversary celebration. It's the thir first Thursday in March. Uh, mark your calendar, details will be coming out. I would say in a month or two. So, so uh, March 3rd uh, would be a date to put on your calendar. Uh, anything first, else for the pause? If not, I, one more. oh, I've Bob. got a quick question. Right, I, I've got a quick question. Uh, doctor, thank you so much. Uh, uh, how, why, why is it that the inner planets uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars really don't have the radiation belts that, but the Earth does. Uh, could you uh, briefly? Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's a that's a really good and good question. In fact, I'll have to tell you that was one of the things that that I would say was a, a strong factor behind going uh, behind the Voyager mission, going to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, now, uh, we flew spacecraft, they were called Mariners, uh, to Venus, and there was no magnetic field detected at Venus. And we also flew uh, one of the Mariners, to uh, several actually, to Mars, and Mars had no magnetic field either. Now, it is believed uh, that Mar Mars, uh, being smaller than the Earth had cooled down faster than the Earth, and it did not have a molten core, and that's the belief, that's the reason it's believed to not have a magnetic field. Now with Venus, Venus is not rotating hardly at all, and of course that's a big issue in itself. Why was Venus not rotating? And most people think it had a collision with some ob large object that took out most of its momentum. And that it is thought that a magnetic field of a planet uh, is produced partly by its rotation. And uh, so now I, I forgot actually what your question was. Was it about the magnetic field? Well, okay, to have a radiation belt, you have to have a magnetic field. So I answered your question essentially by saying there's no magnetic field at Venus or, or uh, 
uh, Mars, so there's no radiation belt. Now, Mercury, it turned out, does have a very weak field, and it's debatable whether it has a radiation belt or not. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, this, did, this did motivate us to try to go to Jupiter, which we thought did have a magnetic field because of the radio measurements at, at Jupiter. I tried to explain that during my talk there. Okay, well, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Garnett, and thank you everybody else, and uh, see everybody next month. Have a great rest of the day, great weekend, okay? Thank you so much. All right, thank you for your time. Thanks again, Don. That was, that Good night, was everybody. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.